Good morning, everybody. It's Wednesday, March 13th, 528 a.m. Central Time. Grain markets are mixed this morning. May corn futures down a quarter cent at 441 and a half. May soybeans down seven and a quarter at 1188 and three quarters. May Chicago wheat up two and a quarter at 549 and three quarters. May Kansas City wheat down three at 594 and a quarter. May spring wheat down one and a half at 670 and a half. Let's talk about row crop price action, which has actually been pretty darn good. Soybean futures posted their best close in a month on Tuesday. The most heavily traded May 24 contract gained nearly 17 cents to close at 11.96 per bushel, the best since February 12th. A lower than expected Brazilian soybean production estimate from Conab paired with additional short covering helped to fuel the rally. Private groups estimate that the funds were net buyers of 5,000 contracts on the day the May 24 corn contract closed unchanged on the day, matching its best close since February 13th. We'll get to Conab in a second. So the break that happened, the big sell-off that happened into late February and the subsequent rally, it was all brought to you by March basis contracts, I believe. I think the reason that corn and soybean futures fell off sharply into first notice day in late February was because the farmer was caught holding these March basis contracts and was forced into a bad decision one way or the other. It was either you had to price them at the lows or you had to roll it forward and eat the carry. Neither decision was good. I suppose in hindsight that the roll uh, was the better option, but it was a very, very difficult decision. So I think there was a big transfer of ownership that happened at the lows, probably more so in corn, but also in soybeans during that late February timeframe. And once that transfer in ownership occurred, um, it went from the farmer to the commercial in a lot of instances. I think there was a lot of that that happened. The market has been able to rally. We've seen some short covering and the funds, large money managers are still very heavily short the markets. The estimate at yesterday's close was that funds were still short 270,000 contracts of corn, which is historically very large and um, net short 150,000 contracts of soybeans, which is historically very large. So now you've got the large money manager or the fund trader sitting here um, ahead of the most important growing season on the planet when it comes to, when it comes to corn and the second most important when it comes to soybeans. Are they out of position here? I don't know if I'd say that necessarily, but they are very heavily short. And I know you guys have heard all the all the bearish talk about supply and demand, but as it relates to the corn market in particular, all that goes out the window if you run into a weather issue. If there's a real U.S. weather issue, if this drought is not alleviated, the funds are going to head for the hills and they will cover this short position. It's just not going to happen for a while. Um, I think that the dry weather that we've seen in the Midwest, if anything, is probably considered to be bearish the market, if anything, until you get into maybe mid to late May. That would be my take on the situation. It will allow for quick planting, uh, that sort of thing. But do the funds want to be this heavily short going into the growing season, knowing that there's weather risk? Uh, that's one of the big questions for me as we move forward here. So on Tuesday, Brazil's USDA, also known as CONAB, lowered its forecast for the Brazilian corn and soybean crops. The agency reduced its estimate for this season's soybean crop by almost 2% to 146.9 million metric tons. The reduction was due to unfavorable weather in the majority of soybean producing areas. The estimate for total corn production was lowered by almost 1% to 112.8 million metric tons. The cut was attributed to farmers planting fewer corn acres. Brazil's second corn crop is estimated to reach 87.3 million metric tons, down 14.7% compared to last season. You got some big time differences between USDA and CONAB, and this was a big debate yesterday. Everybody's talking about USDA versus CONAB. So in corn, the USDA production estimate for Brazil is 443 million bushels higher than CONAB. That is substantial. In soybeans, the USDA estimate is almost 300 million bushels higher than CONAB. That difference is substantial. I personally am not going to get caught up too much in the USDA versus CONAB debate. They don't have to match. They're different data sets. They sh should they move together? Yeah, I guess. And they have to, to some extent. USDA has been really sticky with that corn number in particular. I think the, the thing to pay attention to, if anything, would just be export pricing. Brazilian Brazilian soybeans are still much, much cheaper than what we can offer out of the United States. Uh, corn, we're pretty competitive, and uh, I wouldn't be shocked to see some additional export business here, but um, I wouldn't I wouldn't get too worked up about the USDA versus CONAB thing. It's it's stuff that we've dealt with before. Is it a little extreme this time around? Maybe, but I don't I don't think that's like something you should pay a ton of attention to, honestly. Here's a chart of uh, corn and soy, or I'm sorry, soybean production 
Brazil and Argentina combined, I updated this. So you throw in the new CONAB number, and yeah, Brazil, Argentina combined, you're south of 200 million, which I guess is you know big victory for the Bulls, but it's still a record crop uh, combined. So is is this is that the reason the soybean market rallied yesterday? Yeah, I, I think maybe it has something to do with it. So if you guys have not checked out our premium content, you need to do so. Joe, can you tell me about some of the recent videos you put together? I firmly believe, as I've discussed in the past, that grain marketing has become far too complicated. And I, I try to take the opposite and most simplified approach to all of this. Yesterday, I ran through what we're doing with old crop, corn, soybean, and wheat bushels. I've got a few bushels that I've got to clean up in terms of my uh, official recommendations. And yesterday, I ran through everything that I've done, everything I've advised. How are we going to wrap this up? The old crop stuff. If you guys are sitting on old crop corn, soybeans, or wheat, I think you should check this out, at least just to get a different viewpoint. We don't do any fancy option strategies. Um, it's just straight up cash sales. I tell you, uh, when I when I sold, what I sold, what the fill price was versus the corresponding futures contracts, spit you out a weighted average of what we've done on everything. I think this would be uh, good for at least you guys to take a look at. We had actually two premium videos yesterday. Uh, Chris Barron was on, talked about uh, crop rotation and uh, what you should be considering if you're taught, if you're thinking about swinging acres around, you know, you're thinking about moving some acres from corn to soybeans or whatever. Chris actually made a free tool available, which is excellent. I would highly suggest that you take a look at that. If you guys want to see the premium stuff, go to www.standardgrain.com. You can sign up this morning. This is a $50 per month subscription. You can cancel any time. There's no other fee. There's no other obligation. Nobody will try to sell you anything else. This is just a ton of info direct from us every single business day. Uh, sign up this morning, and I will forward you a copy of this morning's email, which includes that old crop marketing video, uh, Chris's crop rotation update and uh, tool, as well as our six most recent premium videos. So give that deal a shot this morning, guys. Brazilian soybean sales are lagging behind the historical average. Safras and Mercado reported on Monday that Brazilian farmers have sold 54.5 million tons of soybeans. Sales are 36.6% of this season's estimated production, up from 35.4% during the same period last year. However, sales are well behind the five-year average of 50.1%. Safras is projecting this season's soybean crop to reach 149.1 million tons. Some farmers have made sales to cover costs. However, the majority of soybean growers down in Brazil are trying to hold on to their crops until prices rebound. It sounds real familiar. Prices suck, so guys aren't selling. I mean, this is not a friendly factor. We've been, we've been told that um, when the farmer has a lot of ownership, the markets have a tough time rallying. And it's true, unfortunately. It's, it's an unfortunate reality that we have to deal with. When farmers undersold or sitting on a lot, the markets have a tough time rallying. You've got a natural seller that's going to come in and sell the rallies. And uh, that's kind of what's kept a lid on, on a lot of these markets uh, over the last, you know, what, six months now. It's, it, that's a big part of it. So similar things happening in Brazil uh, as are happening here in the United States. The Panama Canal will soon increase daily transit. According to the Canal Authority, daily transits will increase by 12% later this month. The authority implemented restrictions over a year ago when reduced rainfall caused low water levels uh, in the canal's reservoirs. Daily transits through the canal's historical passageways, which serve the majority of vessels, will increase to 20. Passage through the larger Neo-Panamax locks, however, will remain restricted at only seven, uh, seven vessels per day, down from the recent level of 10. Total daily transits by the end of March are slated to rise to 27, which is still only about half of peak levels. So that last sentence tells you the tale. You're still only at half of, of what they could be doing if the situation was ideal. Still, it's increasing a little bit. I would love to uh, see this improve even more and open up some some export channels. Uh, the U.S. Gulf to Asian destinations in particular would be very, very helpful because we haven't sold really any corn to China. China's canceling uh, wheat purchases. Um, this is this has been an ongoing problem. We don't talk about it every day, but it's been an ongoing problem that's that's reduced the affordability of U.S. grain and oil seeds on the export market. Inflation rose faster than expected in February. The February CPI increased by 0.4% for the month and 3.2% compared to last year. 
The monthly increase matched pre-report estimates. The yearly gain, however, was higher than the expected 3.1% and up from January's 3.1% reading. A 2.3% rise in energy cost accounted for 60% of the total increase in headline inflation. On a monthly basis, food costs remain flat while shelter costs rose by 0.4% and gasoline prices surged by 3.8%. The progress on inflation, according to CPI, has largely stalled in this three, three and a half percent neighborhood. Um, and this is the annualized percent change. So this basket of goods and services tracked by the government that consumers buy, it's 3.2% more expensive than it was a year ago. Here's the more important chart. Does it feel like your dollar is buying less than it ever has? Yeah, it does. And the statistics would tell you that that's the fact. Um, the index itself printed at all an all-time high at, at 310.3. That's just the index price. So yeah, the basket of goods and services paid by urban consumers for a mar market basket of, of goods and services, it's it's as expensive as it's ever been. So inflation, um, yeah, it's it's moderated the rate of inflation, but it continues. And and that the upward trajectory of of this chart in particular, this consumer price index chart, really accelerated post COVID when all the money printing and stimulus and and all of that happened. And it continued to accelerate um, as the Fed hiked rates, which is super interesting. Um, we've got a lot of deficit spending going on. This, believe it or not, guys, th these are the good times right now, and the government should be trying to address our financial woes, and they're really not. So uh, what happens when the bad times roll around again? What happens when you get a COVID 2.0 or a 2008 2.0 or a Black Monday 2.0? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of problems with the currency, and that's part of the reason that uh, there are so many things at all-time highs. The stock market's at all-time highs. Gold's at all-time highs real estate's at all-time highs, um, Bitcoin's at all-time highs this morning. I'd love to tell you that corn was at all-time highs, but it's not. So uh, maybe someday. What did cattle do yesterday? Uh, they were higher. Live cattle futures closed an average of 64 cents higher. Feeders closed an average of 92 cents higher. Box beef also took a step higher. Choice gained a buck 71 to close at 310.59 and select gained 72 cents to close at 299.60. Outside markets, uh, U.S. dollars about flat. Stocks are about flat. I believe the S&P posted an all-time high close yesterday. Bonds are flat. Uh, crude oil is up a dollar fifteen at seventy-eight forty in the uh, May WTI. Have a great day, guys. We'll talk to you on Thursday.